this peak department or program, whatever you want to call it. And I was the first student <coughs> in who made it out. I started with, <laughs> I started with uh, which you could say, that oh, took, took a long time in that case, because I only finished last year. But, um, so I started in the fall of 2008. And uh, I was in a class, um, did two classes. I was with uh, Sadie Rosenthal, really nice, really great class. And two other women in the class, who I've never seen again, <laughs> who were doing ETSP, but they just um, disappeared. And then in the January, Mel Euler started, and uh, there was a small bunch of us, I think about 15 of us, something like that. And, um, and then more people came, and more people came, and more people came, and um, I graduated. In, uh, I think I got all my requirements in winter quarter 2011, so last year. And then graduated in June, and um, started working, and um, here I am. Say something about well, anyway, yes, yeah. so I was the first one in, but along with a whole bunch of other people, but they weren't there before, before so I like to say <laughs> um, So, what are we going to get out of this talk this morning? I, I, I'm sure you've had really great career talks about high-flying jobs and uh, whizzy presentations and slides and things. I didn't do any slides. Um, I, I was wondering about it, but I have a personality problem in that I can't start something like that without putting too much into it, and I just do not, do not have time. One of the things I want to get across today is how hard it is to strike a life-work balance. I thought it was hard as a student. It's just as hard out there in the, in the workforce, and I'm still trying to work that out. It's very difficult. I love what I do, and since I worked out to take how to take my computer home and VPN in from home, I just keep going and going and going, and I've only got to work out when to say, sorry, you know, I can't deliver it, but what happens next week? So, um, I, yeah, so, so the angle I want to take today is, is just sort of a real student who really came to Cascadia, really is the ETSP program, and went out the other end, and I want to show you about how I came to do that, and what, what I did when I was here, and um, what I've been doing since. So, a long time ago, I was a very happy optometrist in England, in a gorgeous part of the country with a husband and two tiny children, daughters, in the countryside, and I uh, was working two days a week with the first baby, and one day a week with the second baby, and then I was going to build that up, and my mother was my childcare, it was just this idyllic scenario, except that Oliver was traveling away all the time. And uh, one day he came home and was very excited, he said, there's a piece of work in Seattle, at Boeing, that I'd love to do. And we're all going to go, we can all go. Oh, we've never done that before, usually I just stayed at home hold everything together and he did all the traveling. But, uh, so, that's what we did in 1994. We came for a few weeks and um, I never intended to stop being an optometrist. Well, the contract went well, we kept getting extended for the need and here we still are. Um, he's not still with Boeing though. He started a, a software company with some Boeing guys and then he started traveling again. <laughs> so, um, I did not work once we got here. I wasn't allowed to work to begin with, but eventually we got uh, green cards and I could have worked then. But by that time, my optometry skills were a little you know, old, if you like. And the, the, the system here isn't quite the same anyway. So it's not just a question of showing up and saying, let me, let me examine eyes. Um, but I was very busy, stay at home mom for about 14 years. And then it starts dawning on me. Every now and then I have a little crisis and I'm like, I should be doing something about my career that's stagnating and don't seem to be going back and so on. Um, and then I got over that and I just thought, what shall I do? <laughs> um, and then we also could have little crises about, oh my goodness, it looks like these children that weren't even going to be educated here, you know, they were just two and zero when they came, are not only going to go through the, the uh, school system here, they're going to end up at university here, and rumor has it, that costs a lot of money. So. Uh, and then I also realized that I would be you know, very, very busy <coughs> raising them, but I'm really, really lucky to, to be able to do that on one income. But I knew that I'd need to do something else once they left. So I started trying to work out what that was going to be. And um, I came to Cascadia to ask about an environmental science class. I, got, I was getting more and more hot and bothered about the state of the world and 
the problems I was hearing about sustainability issues. And one of my problems was I just didn't feel like I understood the problems. I was hearing the bits and pieces, but back then, um, the media wasn't doing a great job of explaining it. So I came to, to uh, ask about a class, how, how all that happens. And they told me about the ETSP. So I started, thought, well, I'll have a go at that. And I just love being a student here. It's, it's great, <coughs> really, really great. I loved having a new mission. I loved uh, the fact that I no longer had to worry about my kids' homework. I had plenty of my own to worry about. <laughs> I like that too. So that we're all studying away and trying to be sympathetic about each other's tests and presentations and so on. Um, I didn't know what I was going to do at the other end of this. I didn't know how it was going to be a job. I was, you know, I was pretty nervous about um, that aspect of it. Who would employ someone in their late 40s with, with, who hadn't uh, been in the workforce for such a long time? And how was that all going to pan out? But I tried to relax about that and just decided to take the classes as they came along and see what made my heart race, see what I got excited about. Um, Optometry, you have to do a lot of sciences. Um, and in England, by the way, we start, we, we choose our careers much earlier than here. The, the four-year liberal arts type model here is, is such a luxury, it really is. In England, um, I decided to do optometry at 14, and it worked out very well. No regrets, and a long list of reasons why it was going to work for me, and it did. Um, so at 16, you've got a whole lot of subjects and focus on Four, three or four subjects. So by that time, you're deciding, am I a linguist or am I a scientist? Um, I, you're already deciding, are you going to go into medicine or more or, or whatever it is, or engineering and so on, um, which is very different to here. You know, here people don't have to make those, those decisions quite so early. Um, I've got where I'm going to go with that. Scientist. Yes, that's right. Thank you. So I really enjoyed scraping the rust off the sciences doing math again, <coughs> and mathematics as we call it, and uh, physics and so on. That, that, was, that was good fun. I also enjoyed the other classes. I, again, when you get to uh, university in England at, at 17 or 18 to do optometry, there's no psychology or philosophy or, or no reading literature anymore or any of that sort of thing. So I really enjoyed the other classes in the ETSP program. It was a novelty for me to to study things that weren't strictly um, <coughs> scientific and had a very, very clear suggestion. That was good. Um, as we're getting near the end of the program, I'm getting a little bit more jumpy. My husband's referring more and more, so how are you going to get a job there? <laughs> well, <laughs> don't know. And I was also aware that I had to get an internship as well. And what I was planning to do was um, get a all the non-profits in Seattle and see you know, who would help me check that box. Um, what came along was a class by someone from McKinstry. Um, what was it called? Energy Retrofits of Commercial Buildings, I think? 205, it is from 205. And Jesse Securo from McKinstry came to teach that. And I'd already checked that box, but I decided, no, I've been waiting a long time for this. People from industry to come and teach us. I'll do that one again. <coughs> and um, I'm very glad I did. Halfway through the, uh, three quarters through the quarter, um, Jesse approached me and another student and said that we have a couple of internships available. So um, we said, yep, we'd love to do that. So I did a half time, part time internship at McKinstry, and that, uh, then I was invited to apply for a job as an energy analyst and become part of this new team. That's what I do now. Really, really fortunate, very lucky. Um, so that's how I got there. Let me tell you a bit about what I do now. So my title is energy analyst. I'm not analyzing much energy yet, but um, I work alongside energy analysts. Uh, my job is really, I'll turn that down. It's really managing a database. So. My little department is called Active Energy Management. And we have two types of things going on. One is, I'll tell you about the Power Ed program first. The Power Ed program is a, a, a very new product for <coughs> and it's aimed at school districts. And we're going to be 
piloting it with the city soon, the city of Boulder in Colorado. So school districts really want to lower their costs. You know, huge number of costs they have that they can't do anything about, but energy might be one that they can try and reduce. So they're very interested in reducing their costs and using less energy in an in educational way. To do that. So the Power Ed program is trying to um, set up competition between the school in the school district so that the uh, community at each school is trying to save more energy than the community at the other school. So um, there's a dashboard and the schools can see what percentage of energy and gas and they're saving, what they have the carbon footprint is coming down, hopefully, and so on. And then they have, uh, there's other parts of the power program that I don't have any insight into, but they, there's this energy hog, someone dressed up as a pig that comes along to rally things along, you know, <laughs> excited about um, turning off lights and reminding the teachers to shut down all the computers and, and that, that sort of thing. Um, and then there's, in the background, there's no, history is working with the facilities to help them understand um, where things might be going wrong or going right. But this dashboard is what we, this, what goes into the dashboard is what we do as our department. Um, and it's incredibly, it's turned out to be much more difficult than they thought. They thought it was just a question of getting the energy data, uh, both usage and costs, off the bills, slamming it into a database and chucking out some, some calculations. But uh, for, for lots of reasons, um, that is trickier than it sounds. Not trickier, but anyway, that's what I do. I, I set up, I work out, take a school district, just on a couple of new ones. One is one's in um, Shuckerton, Minnesota, and one is in uh, Colorado, in Montezuma Cortez. And I find out what the schools are called, how many gas meters they have, Electric meters they have, and what numbers involved, the account numbers, the account numbers, all that goes into my database. Then I look at the, the utility bills, and uh, PSC bills, um, PSC and energy bills, they're, they're space age compared to some of these other, these other utility bills. It's very interesting. So nobody cares about the design of the utility bill. The utility themselves, um, they can carry on using the same bills forever. The customer just uh, just looks Greek to them, so they just pay the bill, and as long as the utility is happy, the utility is happy as long as the customer <coughs> pays their bills. We're stuck in the middle. We really care about the information on that bill, and we want to get it all off the bill. And it's at the moment, it's very, very difficult um, to get it off in the way we want. Because of what we're trying to do, we're very interested in which are the fixed costs that we cannot influence, so the basic charge, and what are the variable costs ones related to the energy, so the KW or the KWH or the firms, or if you've got some propane and you've got some steam, some in some places. Um, we, we might need to split those out, and that's tricky in itself. The, uh, the bills to hide all that information is, is I sound like a real whiner, I know, but it's, <laughs> it's a standing joke around our desks that people just say, oh, just get the bills in, and it, there's a lot more to it than that. If I just got the bills in, then they wouldn't like the result. So, um, that's enough about the power program. Something else we did, that all the, the clients that we're doing in active energy management that are not power ed, one of our frustrations is they're all different. We're trying to scale up our, our, our operation, and it's very hard when every plant we take on is, it has its own idiosyncrasies, so that, 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 that takes a lot of time and then to scale up. But, for instance, uh, North Shore School District. Did anyone hear? Tenth North Shore School District. Yeah. So um, big school district, lots of energy being used there. They are very, very interested in managing their budget. So we're just in the middle of um, getting all the energy costs and, and use into our database, and then we, um, we do weather regression, we do tuning. Um, what I meant to ask right at the beginning is how many people are in the ETSP program? They just assume <laughs> lots. I've got all 
my boxes checked for UCSP, I came back to do a statistics class thinking that would help me in my weather regression. It turned out that we just about covered weather regression the last week or so. I sat through a lot of other stuff to get there, but never mind. So um, we have some software. Unfortunately, it's outside of our database, so we can't. It's called Tune when we do this. We try to find a relationship between a meter or the energy going through a meter and the weather. And this is really important because what McKinstry's main, uh, or a big part of McKinstry's business is energy retrofits of buildings. And people are very interested because it's going to cost them a bunch of money. Afterwards, did this work? Am I saving any money? I look at the bills, it doesn't look that much better. How much of that is because of the weather? And so we put the energy usage data, no costs, into, um, take it from our database, put it into the software, which is called metrics, the industry standard, if you like. And with weather regression, we tune the so we work out what the relationship is, where the line and predict, if you like, the relationship between um, that weather and that meter. And um, I'm training to do that and getting better at it gradually. Uh, one of my other analysts baseline equation, which is the equation that describes the weather. Now, weather is, uh, I won't go into it very much, but if you've got heating degree days and cooling degree days, and then you might have independent variables, such as school days. Are people at school or not? Um, and so we usually use that for tune and school. So you end up with this equation of um, the, the, wet, the, the usage of, say, KWH in this building will be this many days, this many, uh, this factor times the number of heating degree days, this factor to plus this factor, another factor, times the number of cooling degree days, plus another factor times the number of school days in a period. And so that goes, that equation goes into our database and um, spits out at the other end when the new weather comes along, what the users should have been. So you have a baseline and hopefully below an actual line. And then the gap is the energy Cost, yeah, the energy avoided or the cost avoided, and put the money into. And so um, the power record does all this. And that's uh, what everybody's very interested in. Did we actually save you any money because you had uh, takes out? It's normalizing as well. That's it's good fun. It's just it's great to carry on learning new things that aren't just you know sort of add things like the terrible, the terrible. Um What we also do is we try to work out from the energy data we're getting, um, should these buildings in cities or schools, for instance, be doing something different with their schedules? Should they be starting up later? Should they be turning things off in a different order? And so on. I haven't done very much of that. I'm looking forward to that a lot. Um, when we get better, we're, we're going to be outsourcing this bill entry. I'm managing that whole process. It's going to be done in Texas, um, but it's, it, yeah, it's harder than, than we think it's going to be. Um, what else can I tell you about? Does anyone have any questions yet? No? Yeah? When, when you say you put the equation into the database, can you say a little more about what that's? Okay, doing yes. Actually, I didn't describe the whole thing. The rest of the equation is all about 
what the balance points are, when the heating starts, what, what temperature the heating kicks in, and what temperature the cooling kicks in, and what part of the tune is. Um, the weather, you have to, in that long equation, you've also got the weather point, you've got to make sure you're using weather in the right place, because it can sort of differ enormously. Um, and there's a few other boring little bits and pieces. So you end up with this long equation of stuff that has to go in. And I use a thing called the um, database query tool. Shows the weather I've got an equation in there and how it's working and all the calculations. We try to make it as visible as possible. But it's, um, I didn't have a clue. Well, something I want to get across to you all is that I didn't have a clue that this was being sort of developed. I sort of presumed that if I went to a company like the industry, that everything would be sorted out, there'd be a complete process already, and I just sort of said, here you go, this is what we've been doing for 15 years, on your terminal sheet, she'd teach you how to do it, get on with it. <laughs> and I kind of thought I wanted that, but I realise now that it is, more, it is much more fun to be innovative and developing and so on. But it is frustrating as well, because other people at McKinsey Street don't have a clue how what we're doing is, is new. Well, they know it's newish, but they don't, they presume we've sorted it all out. They realise we haven't sorted it out. We are sorting it all out. And they're, they're a little surprised at how long things take, and they presume there's an army of us, and there's not. <laughs> something that I, I hadn't realized when I was here. I just presumed, you know, I'd look up job descriptions and 